extracts from Winter in Richmond Park from the book The Woodland Life by Edward Thomas. Many know Edward Thomas, killed by a sniper's bullet in 1917 as one of the war poets. But when he perished, aged 39, he was already an established writer and literary critic. He regarded poetry as the highest form of literature, but only started writing it in 1914. Thomas lived much of his early life in southwest London, and in his teens, he walked and cycled the roads and paths of London, Surrey, Sussex, Hampshire, and Wiltshire, writing about his experiences and observations of people, places, and wildlife. His first ever published work in 1897, written when Thomas was just 18, was The Woodland Life. He dedicated one beautiful chapter in essay form to a winter in Richmond Park, and I am delighted to read these extracts. A keen frost and a gray hanging fog have numbed and silenced all life within the park. Not a sound trembles through the heavy air. The rooks that travel over each day at dawn linger yet in their roosting trees, and no sullen call reaches us from their dark forms high up in the elms. Starlings, whose myriad wings make a faint music through the morning air as they pass for distant meadows, are also delaying their flight. Until sunlight pierces the gloom, they will not stir. From the outermost twigs of a broad-spreading chestnut, the stem is quite invisible, and the boughs above are lost in gray, so dense is the mist. Nestling against the tr trunk are scattered groups of sparrows, hardly moving, and betrayed only by a half-hearted chip at rare intervals. The melancholy, long-drawn whistle of a starling that sits with ruffled plumage in the same tree is the only other break in the stillness. The windows of a cottage facing southeast flash back the first bright sunbeam. A rustling breath of wind sighs through the dense foliage of the spruce firs and disperses the fog, till all around countless points of frosty crystal glitter in the tardy sunlight. Slowly the landscape is unfolded as the fog retires, and depths of woodland unseen before loom slowly into view. And when at last the mist hovers above the elms of the horizon and the far-off mere, from a kindly veil of fawn doubling back to the grass, the morning lark climbs high into grey space. Instantly, as in answer to a signal, the shivering birds scatter from their retreats of knothole, tussock, and rugged oak limb. Widespread companies of rooks go dinning overhead, and the, starling, the starlings take a hurrying flight eastward. On every side, the clamoring sparrows descend to scour the grass and the bramble under wood. Some of them wander to the pools, and where the ice does not prevent, indulge themselves in a bath spraying the water with their rapid play of wings and quarrelling noisy for the best places. Past rolling acres of dead bracken and mossy banks drilled with rabbit burrows, giant oaks rising on either hand, the broad track of Greenswood descends to the pen ponds. Tis here, girt about by tufted bushes and gently sloping turf, where the duck dabbles mid the rustling sedge and feeding pike starts from the water's edge, or the swan stirs the reeds, his neck and bill wetting that drip upon the water still, and heron, as resounds the trodden shore, shoots upward, darting neck before. The wild duck are invisible, but their haunt is where the flags grow thickets, and rustling alders throw a deep shade. More hens creep among the rushes, and every now and again, their startling cry comes weirdly along the shore. The chapter later concludes. With the approach of night, the mist has again lightly gathered, and the sun setting over the western oaks is quite obscured. 
Empty husks of Spanish chestnuts crunch audibly underfoot, but farther on the walking is soft and silent over the velvety sward. Not yet retired for his winter sleep, a bat wheels in eccentric curves overhead, and as he flits above the moonlit pool, a faint shadow of him falls on the shimmering surface. <laughs> 